What's up? Welcome to another episode of Movie Pitch Monday. My name is Edward Mullen, and if you don't know, I'm the author of the Art of the Hustle series, the Prodigy series, Eden, The Secret Manuscript, I Am Rome, and about a dozen other books. I'm also host of this show, which is a hypothetical movie pitch show. I have no intention of actually making these movies. These are not real pitches, just fun hypothetical movie ideas. Now, yesterday I found out there's going to be a Wu-Tang TV series. And for context, I am a massive Wu-Tang fan. And I had to try my hand at pitching what I think would be a cool idea. So at the time of the recording this, there's been no trailer, there's been no episodes. I haven't, I don't know anything. I just know, I heard it on uh, Angela Yee. Uh, on uh, Breakfast Club, she's talking to Jonah Hill and she mentioned it and I googled it and it looks like it's coming to Hulu. So as you can imagine, I'm a huge Wu-Tang fan and I'm super pumped to see the show. I have the Wu Manual. I've got the Tao of Wu. I even have the original 36 Chamber tape that I got in 1993 for Christmas. Funny story about that, which I won't go into. But anyway, so I've watched every interview of the RZA, I have all their albums, all like the the individual albums of all like the the members. Um, I've watched the the movie Iron Fists. I I love Wu Tang Clan. What I think makes this so interesting, rather than having a two hour movie, is that there's so much rich history with the Wu Tang Clan because it dates back from like the early 90s. You could go off onto so many different you know side stories and um, you know. You can introduce people like, you know, uh, Notorious B.I.G. and, you know, Puff Daddy and see what they're doing, like all that kind of New York scene, Busta Rhymes. You could tell those kind of cool stories. It doesn't just have to be about Wu-Tang. It could kind of be like hip hop from that genre, like kind of through the lens of, of the Wu-Tang Clan. You could do an entire TV series just on the RZA. It doesn't even have to be necessarily the Wu-Tang Clan, just the RZA's life. So there's so many different directions that you could take and there's so much rich history to pull from. And while I know a lot of that history, cause I've read you know a lot of the books and I've watched a lot of interviews and documentaries and all kinds of stuff, it's very difficult for me to kind of piece together what I think would be an interesting story. So. I'm actually going to skip a lot of like the details and like the, the the stories, although I will include some of those and I will disclose when, you know, they're real stories from like the books that I've read or interviews. Um, but mostly this pitch is gonna be about painting broad strokes. I just wanna kind of capture the story arc and what I think would be kind of cool pacing and structure of a TV series. So like the opening episode, the kind of arc along season one, um, the finale, the season two opener, the finale. So I'm just kind of painting like the arcs and I'm gonna, you know, put in some of the kind of details and the stuff that we know and love. Um, but this pitch is really, you know, if if the Wu-Tang was actually getting involved in this uh, TV series, which I assume they would, uh, they'd make it way better than me because they actually know those, those stories and I don't. So I'm not going to try to compete with that. Okay, so without further ado, this is my Wu-Tang TV series pitch. Okay, so season one, episode one, I would open with, you know, establishing shots of New York City in like the 90s, kind of have that gritty kind of look and feel to it which I talked about on like my sly pitch, but this would have like, you know, the smoke coming uh, in through like the manhole covers, have some like homies in like baggy clothes and like the, the polo jackets and the, the hill figure jackets on corners and like the projects. I'd have like, um, you know, graffiti and subway and maybe people break dancing in the park. I'd really kind of establish New York City before I show anything. And in the background would be like some dope hip hop from that era. It wouldn't necessarily be Wu-Tang, but some dope hip hop beat. And then as I'm showing these different kind of the scenes of what New York looked like in the 90s, the early 90s, um, I would have, you know, the music kind of get louder and louder and then it's in the studio. So that's kind of like my establishing shot. Then I'd have like the studio and it'd be a young Jizza uh, in the booth rhyming. And then like Riza, AKA Rakim would be like tweaking dials in like the studio. Now, for those of you who don't know, Riza and Jizza, they're cousins and they actually had solo careers. Uh, Riza was Prince Rakim. And that's why I'm gonna be calling him Rakim throughout this because he doesn't become Riza till later. And uh, so he came out with uh, Prince Rakim um, and as a solo artist and Jizza, I think he was like the genius or something, I can't remember his name. Uh, and they had solo careers, which from my understanding, they weren't really that successful. Um, they weren't really moving units and they were actually quite broke. Now, Riza at the time was, you know, getting into a little bit of trouble. I think he got his girlfriend pregnant 
and he has to really start, you know, making moves and figuring out what he wants to do with his life. All right, so Jizz is in the booth and he's spitting some bars and he's kind of feeling off. He's not really feeling it. And he's like, yo, cut, comes out of the booth, sits down. He's kind of noticeably upset. And Riz is like, yo, bong bong, what it does, what it do. He's like speaking that kind of Riz Wu-Tang slang that we all know and love. And Jizz is like, yo, man, this, this shit that I'm spitting is whack. He's like, well, why don't you spit something better? He's like, well, this is like what the studio wants the direction the studio wants to go he's like man I, i'm not really feeling it then he starts speaking about like supreme science and divine mathematics which i don't pretend to understand but this is like these books are like filled with that kind of stuff and like you know that jizza if you watch any jizza rizza interviews they always talk about that like numerology and that kind of stuff so i would have some like jizza they come the genius because he's really smart with this kind of stuff and he's kind of schooling the rizza who's equally wise but just maybe kind of hearing these concepts not necessarily for the first time, but he's kind of like soaking it in, right? So they're like, all right, let's 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 deal with this later, right? So they leave and, you know, they're smoking a little bit, partying a little bit, smoking some blunts, and they go to a kung fu flick. Now, if you know anything about the Wu-Tang Clan, you know that they have a ton of Wu-Tang or like a ton of like kung fu samples and RZA is like all about kung fu, right? And which kind of features prominently in this uh, season one. So... They're watching this kung fu flick and you can kind of see the story that i want to tell is like rizza's picking up all the pieces that he needs in order to formulate this idea that we know he's going to come up with he's eventually going to come up with the wu-tang clan but he doesn't know that yet so he's watching kung fu flicks he's listening to like jizza talk about stuff and we see kind of the wheels spinning and he's piecing things together right and uh so after they leave the the kung fu flick maybe they get a slice of pizza uh, maybe they holler at some girls and they go to like a record shop. He's like, yo, yo, let's go in here. And they're kind of digging through the crates and Riza finds what he's looking for, which is all these old like Kung Fu samples, right? And he's like, yo, check this out, joint, yo, brother. Like, you know, speaking all that like Riza stuff. I don't speak like Riza, but you, you kind of get the idea. So they buy all these, these, uh, these vinyl, right? These 12 inch vinyl and they go to Riza's house. Rizza has his apartment and the projects. I think it's uh, Park Hill. I think he lives in Park Hill at this time. I, I can't remember. Um, and so he, uh, so they're like DJing and like spinning the records, and it's all that stuff that we know and love from the Thirty Six Chamber, like Shaolin shadow boxing and the Wu Tang sword style. And uh, I'd like to try your Wu Tang sword style. Let's begin. So he's like, oh Wu Tang, that's that's ill. Like you know, we should call ourselves Wu Tang. And he's starting to piece that together, right? So as the day goes on, Riz is kind of making beats. He's like, you know, just immersed in like technology and spinning and cutting and making beats. And there's, you know, they're smoking and they're rapping. He's just kind of freestyling. And it's like really dope. He's like, man, I've never heard any beat that sounds like that, right? And, uh... And so, you know, as the day progresses, more and more people kind of show up at his house. And Riza, if you don't know, this is true story. He's known as like the abbot, which is like, he had like a, a neutral house. So he was kind of friends with everybody. And people who come to his house were like opposing gang members. So like, you know, you know, gang A and gang B didn't get along, but at Riza's house, they're all cool. And he kind of was known as somebody who had wisdom and people would go to him for advice. So I would show that he's at the crib and people are like coming up like, yo, this guy tried to kill me, but that guy would be in his kitchen and Rizza would try to be like the middleman and speaking that kind of King Solomon wisdom. And he'd be like, so Rizza's like, yo, my brother, a samurai should make every decision inside of seven breaths, like dropping this kind of esoteric wisdom on him, right? Like he's been dropping this stuff the whole, the whole episode, right? And it's really, really dope. And so the party's going on, they're smoking a little bit of, you know, blunts, drinking, and ODB, who, if you don't know, is the cousin of Rizza and Jizza, he shows up, and this guy's crazy, he's like, really partying and, and drinking, he's got his shirt off, he's dancing on the table, and he's doing, you know that old dirty bastard kind of like, singing that he does, that singing rapping, well he's doing that. And he's just kind of making up on like this freestyle. And the lyrics aren't really that tight, but like for some reason it sounds dope. And then like somebody's like, yo, your man is bugging. That guy is crazy. And Riz is sitting back like, you know what? It's, it's actually kind of hot. I'm not going to lie. Like I kind of like that, right? And I feel like if I wrote some lyrics for this dude, we might have something. So he's kind of put that on the back burner. He's, you know, we're, we're seeing Rizza kind of piece together a story here, right? Okay, so later that night, we got Rizza, Jizza, ODB, and we got a bunch of other guys that we don't necessarily know their names. They would be prominent in hip hop, but they wouldn't be like Method Man or anything like 
Busta Rhymes. It would be it would be some people that if you're in the know, you'd know who they are. And so they go to this club. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe RZA, Jizza, and ODB have a group called All In Together. I, I might be mistaken, but I think that's true. And so they get on stage and they're rapping. And it's dope and there's girls there. And, and this is kind of like the closing of episode one. And they sit down in the in like kind of this back area. They're on couches. People are giving them daps, telling them like, you know, these are signed artists. A lot of people like pay them respect and everybody knows who they are. So they're getting like free drinks and girls coming chatting with them. And then this this dude comes up with this other guy. He goes, yo, let me introduce you to my mans. He goes by uh, Tony Starks, AKA Ghostface Killer. And he's like, yo, what's up? And they kind of have a dap. And then that's like the end of the episode. So ending of episode one, we got RZA, Jizza, ODB, and the ghost face killer and that's kind of season one episode one okay so season one episode two i would open with a new cast of characters i would focus on ghost face killer and raekwon and these guys are very different than rakim and jizza these guys are like street dudes like those riz and jizza they're street dudes but they're like signed artists and there's somewhat legitimacy to them Ghostface and Raekwon, they are like rob people. They are not nice people. They're selling drugs. So I'd follow their storyline, figure out kind of what their backstory is, who they are. Again, this is broad strokes. I don't necessarily know those details, but we'd have something like that, right? Uh, I would cut to uh, Riza, and Riza is, you know, playing chess and he's reading books, he's making beats. And one of the things I love about uh, the RZA is that he used to go on these long walks. Now, I'm going to read you something from uh, the Tao of Wu where it talks about RZA going on these long walks. And I absolutely love this and I just want to uh, kind of capture it. So if you don't mind, I'll just read you a bit of this. This is, if you have the book, it's on page, I think, 101. And it says, um, in April of 1991, I got back to New York on a mission at my trial. Okay, so Riza, actually this will come up later. Okay, I'll tell you that later. So um, at the trial, my mom's inspired me to uh, walk the right path. Uh, in Staten Island, I walked every day for hours. I mean, I walked like Demo. I don't know who that is. Uh, walked all the way from India to China. I'd walk from Park Hill Projects to the Staten Island Ferry Dock from the new Brighton and Stapleton projects, walking through May, June, and July. Some of the people thought I was crazy because they'd see me out there walking and talking to myself. Later, I told one of them, I may have been talking, but I wasn't talking to myself. Those walks were a form of meditation, which uh, a wisdom seeker should practice. Like most meditation, those walks on Staten Island didn't create something, they revealed something. Something that was already floating over the island, ready to take form. I found what I wanted to do, could do, and should do was form a record company, collect the best MCs that I know, and become a kind of rap group that no one has ever imagined. So, so anyway, I'll stop it there because I think that's really cool. He's going on these long walks and uh, you know, kind of formulating a plan. And this is from the Tao of Wu. So I bring that up because in my debut novel, The Art of the Hustle, I also talk about going on long walks. Chapter 15, it says, I would go on long walks for hours. I did some of my best thinking on those walks. It comes up in some other chapters, but that's basically it. The, the story of The Art of the Hustle is this kid kind of, you know, using things that he sees and piecing together kind of like a tech company, kind of like RZA. So I just really love that. I read this, I wrote this in 2010 and I read this, you know, a couple years ago. So when I thought, saw that RZA also did that, I got super excited. Okay, so episode two, episode three, episode four, I would just show like different groups of characters. I would have like, you god and inspector deck and method man and we all kind of see their backstories and they don't necessarily know uh rakim aka the rizza at that point but they eventually kind of come around and uh hang out at rizza's house and you know they kind of know each other through uh, maybe like the underground rap world or whatever and uh you know they're watching kung fu movies and playing video games, reading comic books, and like a friendship forms with these like eight kind of group members, right? And they are like, you know, watching these kung fu movies, like, yo, that's me, yo, that one's me, which is true, I got that from the book. So they're all like 
creating these personas and these identities and trying to kind of live vicariously through some of these characters. So I just think that'd be kind of cool to put that in the TV series as well. Okay, so remember I was reading that bit from the Tao of Wu and I'm like, I'll get to that later. So in 1991, Riza was driving uh, his sister's car and he had some girl, I believe in the story, uh, it was Ghostface Killer's girl, one of the, the a girl that uh, he knew, right? So Riza was like giving her a ride home or something like that and wouldn't you know, this girl's boyfriend pulls up to Riza at a red light, just coincidentally. And he looks over and he sees his girl next to Riza and he is really pissed. He gets to the car, starts smashing the windows, kicking the door in and Riza takes off, right? And these guys give chase and there's a little bit of a chase and they eventually get away and they just kind of lay low for like a couple hours. And uh, this girl lived at the end of a street on like a cul-de-sac. And so they, Rizzo like creeps up with this girl and eventually drops her off, but it was an ambush. And these guys get out and they start shooting. Now Rizzo's strapped, so he takes out his gun and he starts firing back. And I believe one of the guys gets shot and killed. Uh, Rizzo nearly escapes death. And Rizzo eventually gets charged, arrested with um, uh, like manslaughter or something like that, a second degree murder or something like that. And the case eventually gets dropped because it was like proven to be self-defense. And, um, but it kind of taught him a lesson to like, wh wherever he is in the, in the projects, trouble seems to have a way of finding him. So now more so than ever, he's got a new lease on life. He's like, I almost died. I have to get out of here. I have to make moves. So this is like episode five, I'd have this scene in the, in the TV series. So, so over the course of the episode, we see like Riza and Jizza playing chess and reading comic books, watching movies, hanging out with like the friends. Um, in one story in this book, uh, The Tao of Wu, um, Riza and Ghostface Killer are hanging out at like 160th Park Hill, I, I think that's the address, and they see Method Man and they're like, yo, uh, what do they call him? Uh, Shaquan, yo, Shaquan! And, uh, which is not Method Man's real name, but uh, so he, he's like, oh, hey, what's up? And he runs across the street and just as he does that, there's like, I, I wasn't really clear, it sounds like there's like a drive-by shooting or something like that, and had Method Man not been distracted and ran across the street at that moment, like had Riza and Ghostface not been there and called him over, Method Man would have been in the line of fire and have, would have been killed. So I'd put that in there. And some guy did get killed. Some like, I think they described him as some like nice dude. So I really want to paint the picture that this is not a nice environment uh, to be in. It's very, very dangerous. So as the season plays out, it's like 10 or 12 episodes. We're seeing a lot of kind of the backstory of these characters and, and who they are and how they come together and some of the kind of things that make them unique. And this is, you know, very broad strokes. Um, I won't go into too much of the details here, but you get the idea. And uh, near the end of the season, we see Riza making a beat for which will eventually become Protect Your Neck, which is their debut song. So he's kind of making the beat, putting in that like Kung Fu style uh, slang. We have, um, you know, one of the guys, I can't remember his name, I think it's like Divine something. He drew, like draws the Wu-Tang logo. So he comes up with the name. He's like, yo, uh, I'm no longer gonna be Rakim. I'm gonna go by the name Riza or the Riza Recta, uh, Ruler, Zigzag, Ziggler Law, the Abbot. Like he's kind of coming up, oh, Bobby Digital, another one. So he's coming up with a lot of these kind of aliases and these other dudes, maybe they had different aliases and, and Method Man is like, yo, I'm gonna be called Method Man and I'm gonna be called the Old Dirty Bastard. Like maybe they had different names throughout the season. Uh, but then they start kind of adopting like, yo, I'm going to be uh, Raekwon the chef because I'm always cooking up stuff. And I don't know. I think it'd be kind of cool to show how they got their names. And in the finale, the final episode of the season, Riza comes to these dudes with a plan and he's like, yo, uh, sits them all down. And he's like, look, man, uh, I got a plan to take us to number one, but I need five years. Give me like sign a contract. Like, this isn't a dictatorship. I'm driving this bus. Don't ask me where we're going. Don't ask me to drive. Like, don't don't get involved in any decision. Don't question my authority. I need, you know, complete dictatorship control for the next five years, and I promise you we'll be number one. Uh, and I need you to sign this contract. And there's other stories which I could put in there. Like, I think, this is going off the top of my head. I think uh, Riza to kind of test their commitment and their loyalty, he said, okay, you all owe me like a hundred bucks to pay for this studio time, just to see if they would do it. Like he'd already paid for the studio, but, and some of the members paid him and some of them didn't, but I don't know, I put like a story like that in. And so the the last episode, we see them signing this contract and 
you know, maybe people a little bit like hesitant about it and they're rapping. Um, they're kind of piecing together the Wu that we're like, yo, we're going to call ourselves the Wu Tang clan. And this is going to be like the vision. They're kind of like piecing that together. And they put out a song called uh, Protect Your Neck. And that's like the season kind of finale. Okay, so season two, I would open up maybe a little bit ahead of where season one ended. So they've got, you know, radio buzz. They're now like screen printing Wu-Tang shirts. They're passing out flyers. They're still not huge. They're very, very underground. They're doing shows and, you know, people are freaking out. They're going to radio stations, doing interviews, and they're maybe gaining a little bit of buzz, but they're not like the Wu-Tang clan yet. So they just have basically have one song. So season two, is going to be basically the making of 36 Chambers, which is going to be sick. We get to see some of the kind of intricacies behind like, you know, maybe Method Man gets his own song, like M-E-T-H-O-D, and some of the other brothers are feeling salty about that. Like, yo, why does he get his own song? And why is Method Man on all, on all the hooks? And yo, how come he gets to rap first on this beat? And like, maybe there's some like squabbling going on. I think that'd be kind of cool to see some like the behind the scenes. And there's a line in a Ghostface song. I can't remember what where it is. I think it's on actually Raekwon's album, uh, Only Built for Cuban Links, where he's like, call the ambulance, Jamie's been shot, word to Kimmy, don't go son, you my motherfucking heart. Like that lyric, that actually, that verse is so, so good. If you can listen to it, it's, it's really, really good. Um, I would actually have the scene that that rap is about play out in one of the episodes, like episode four, season two, episode four or five. This, Jamie girl gets shot and dies in like Ghostface's arms and he comes to the studio and raps that but let's just put that in there somewhere so like a lot of the stuff that we hear from the album I would probably like call it out like I'd play it out in real life so Raekwon's talking about like you know uh, polo jackets I would have him like go steal a polo jacket or something like that so you could kind of see the making of from their real life and they can you can see them like pulling on from their real life experiences to make this album so season two is all about that and they the, the season finale season two they drop 36 chambers and then it ends so season three would be a little bit fast forward from the end of season two and now this thing is blown up we see like the poster they're making music videos they are all on like the charts people buying the albums, they're doing like huge concerts. And then I would maybe focus on like Method Man. Uh, you know, he's got a relationship. He's trying to make his side project, uh, the uh, Tikal album. So I just show, like you could just go on for like 10 seasons, like on the other side projects and all their stories. But anyway, th that's broad strokes. And really the, the point I wanna make is like the season one is, you know, I want to tease it. I don't want to give you Wu-Tang right away. I just want like the entire season. We only get one song, Protect Your Neck. Season two is, we we still don't see their fame. We see them, the making of 36 Chamber. And season three is when we see Wu-Tang in their kind of glory. And I think that would be a kind of a cool pacing and a cool arc and where you could start the story. Um, but what do I know? So anyway, there it is. There's my Wu-Tang pitch. I hope you liked it. Leave a comment in the section below if uh, you can think of ways we can make it better, if there's things I missed or whatever. Um, I just came up with this an hour ago, so there's a lot of ideas that I could have did, but I didn't. So thank you so much for watching the video. If you liked it, please hit the like button. If you'd like to hear more pitch videos like this, please hit the subscribe button. Uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.